broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, well, welcome everyone to this meeting of the Virtual IMS User Group. Uh, thank you for joining us. So, um, I'm Trevor Edels. I'm CEO of iTechEd Limited. We're a mainframe consultancy, analysis, and technical authoring organization. We're responsible for the content on the Virtual IMS website and we produce newsletters. And if you've got colleagues who are interested, we also look after the virtual CICS user group. So, um, as usual, what I'll do is just quickly run through the agenda for this meeting. As usual, most of the meeting will be taken up with the presentation. And today our guest presenter is Dennis Eichelberger. He's IT specialist, IMS Support Washington System Center with IBM. And his talk is called Pervasive Encryption and IMS. And a copy of the slides from this presentation will be on our website later today. That's the fundy.com forward slash virtual IMS. That's the website URL. Um, and if you missed any of our previous meetings, you can um, download copies of the presentations or you can watch them again. They're on the resources page of that website. Following Dennis's presentation and any questions you have for him, we'll move on to the latest IMS news and latest IMS related articles. Feedback requests is there to remind me to ask you for your feedback about this virtual meeting. Then I'll give you the dates and times of the next couple of virtual meetings. And that's pretty much the plan for the meeting. I'm anticipating that it will last for just under an hour. Anyway, um, as I just said, today's presentation is from Dennis Eichelberger. Dennis has over 35 years of mainframe operating and database systems. He's worked as a developer, a consultant, business partner, and a vendor to IBM. Dennis is currently a member of the IMS support team of the Washington Systems Center. And he tells me in his spare time, he likes practicing the gentle way. So, uh, Dennis, I'd like to thank you very much for being with us today. And what I'm going to do now is pass control of the meeting over to you. So thank you, Dennis. OK. Thank you for that. Now I should be showing my screen. Is yeah. it showing up? For OK, super. That's great. Um, I anticipate one of the questions already with the uh, introduction that Trevor gave me of what is the gentle way. Um, it is judo. Just so you're aware. <laughs> Get that one out of the way. All right. I am going to talk about pervasive encryption and IMS. I have IMS 15 on my initial slide here because IMS 15 has added some PTFs that help encryption when we're working with IMS. This presentation has to do all, with a lot of IMS, uh, encryption to start with. I'm gonna start talking with why some of the, in, the algorithms used and the keys that we use and why we use particular keys and how they are going to apply to an online transaction environment. Uh, then we'll get into some IMS specifics as what is supported and what isn't. Um, so, Questions along the way. Um, I'm told that if they do come up, and our uh, Trevor will interrupt me as I take a breath, and I'll do my best to answer those. Um, my email is also on this slide, so if there are questions that come up after the fact, please feel free to contact me. Okay, so the first thing is, you know, data com protection and compliance. This is one of the big things. We've got some regulatory information out of the European Union, the GDPR. And what's interesting is that in the US, we also have similar legislation in progress in some of our larger states. I've been working with encryption for quite a while, and some of this information is um, has been around a while, but it's fairly current as to the numbers. 26% um, of a company is likely to be breached in the next 24 months. And as we go further and breaches get faster and faster, more of that's going to happen. The big thing is that it's gonna cost a lot of money per breach. In the US, if someone gets breached, that company that was breached 
is probably going to be fined, one, and two, have to have a credit monitoring done for every one of those clients that was breached. So what it comes down to is that we are not any longer in a position of if we get breached, but when. When is it going to happen? So the idea is to be prepared so that even if you are breached, the data at rest is encrypted and therefore not useful to whoever gets it. Next slide on three, I repeat this. It's not a matter of if, but when. And why do we do this? We have regulation. There's regulatory compliance. There's industry standards where everyone has an expectation that someone entity like a bank will protect your information. And that turns into customer satisfaction. Um, a year ago, there were breaches in one of the credit reporting agencies, and most of my friends are not happy with that credit reporting agency. So it's a satisfaction issue. The other thing that comes up, this is incredibly important. Many breaches occur and you don't know about it. There's instances of a company that was breached 18 months before it was discovered. The forensic analysis also showed that they were breached prior to that, but it was much more subtle, and that was three months before the one that they found, 18 months before they discovered the real breach. So we've got an average time of 190, 191 days at this point. I'll even point out that there is one breach that is reported that nobody knew about it until a government agency showed up on one of the breaches front porches asking them for their ID and if they had done such a thing. So it does become a big issue. Not only that, there are no do-overs. If anyone is familiar with a Michael Fox movie, there's no such thing as the DeLorean that will travel back in time. We cannot do that. So let's be prepared so that if it happens, when it happens, we are not subject to some of these rules. We have the data protected. So the IBM model for pervasive encryption on slide four here shows we've got network encryption, which I'm not going to talk too much about. That's a completely different story because it gets outside of the, the mainframe. Data set and file encryption, coupling facility encryption, a secure service container, and all of this using our integrated cryptographic hardware, which we'll talk a little bit about also. So here's the picture. Now, what I want to show is our triangle or pyramid of what goes on. A lot of information coming out is underneath pervasive encryption tends to be focused on the file or data set level as that's all there is. There are four different levels as shown here. From the bottom up is hardware encryption. That's complete disk and tape encryption. And that's tamper proof against physical move removal if it has to go out for repair or if someone is working on it as an SE they cannot see the data. File or data set level, that's our next level up. It is broad protection. It is basically outside of the application. The application does not see it. They're not affected by it. And it can be controlled by your current security access facility, RACF, ACF2, or the like. We move up to the next level, which is database encryption. This is slightly more granular. It has some advantages over data set. Uh, don't get the two confused, nor believe that they have to be unique to each other. They can exist, coexist, and be able to encrypt twice to get to the storage media. These are specifically for DBMS type systems. And the one that I'm going to talk about is our Guardian product, which is for DB2 and IMS. Uh, it covers both of them with the same tool. The highest level and most granular is an application programmer involvement. Um, this is where the encryption information, the key that we're using, the levels of encryption, perhaps even the password, is incorporated into the application. And that presents some difficulties in the sense of one of our rules is that we rotate the keys periodically. And every time that key rotates, the application needs to be taken care of also possibly in the sense of recompile and rebind. 
So this becomes much more invasive to an application. They are aware of what's going on. <clears throat> so four levels, file, full disk, database, and application. I'll spend a lot of time on database encryption because that's the one that pertains to IMS directly. So first off, let's go through some of the algorithms that we have on the mainframe. Our first one is DES, our data encryption standard. And that's a 56-bit. It's sort of weak and not too acceptable today. Essentially, it's a plain text. We encrypt and then use the same key to decrypt in the reverse. Pretty straightforward, not as acceptable as some of the others that we'll talk about. The next one what we refer to is TDES, that's Triple Data Encryption Standard, and it's an expansion of the DES. We expanded the key to 128 bits, which is much more acceptable. We have three keys actually involved. With key one, we will take the plain text and encrypt it the first time. With key two, we'll decrypt it, and it will end up looking like an encrypted cipher on text two because it's a different key and we'll take a third key and re-encrypt it again. So there's a lot of overhead here, lots of keys involved moving it back and forth. So as an overhead, as a resource usage, this is much more impactful than the DES because we're doing these calls more often. And as we get into the what we understand how the keys work, this can become an even more of a problematic condition. Here's our advanced encryption standard. We can have 128, 192, or 256 bit. It is a commercially used algorithm. Um, it does a lot of things, as you can see. It does uh, four steps per round with multiple rounds. We byte substitute, shift some rows, mix some columns, add a round key, and we get this picture. So just looking at this picture, you can understand this is a pretty sophisticated encryption model. And the one, I'll bring this up, right, the 256-bit AES standard is what is used in hardware-level compression and in the file-level or data set-level encryption. There is no alternative. Those are what you get. That is the default. And that is also the highest level that we offer as a commercial algorithm and key. In the database level, we have the option of using this or the two previous encryption methods that I showed. So how do we do this? Um, here's a quick rundown on the Crypto Express cards. This is a separate hardware feature. Uh, it's tamper-proof, and there are various levels that sit onto various uh, mainframe boxes that we have. And over the measurements we've done for the past few years, the CEX5S on the Z13 was twice as fast as what we could get on the Z12. And this CEXS, which is on our current Z14, is five times plus faster over that. And I say plus because that depends upon what you're encrypted and how many calls you're actually going to do to encrypt the items and the pieces that are being encrypted. They support key management for key creation and distribution. Most people in the IMS type of world or the DB2 type of world, since they overlap, will not be involved in creating keys. But it is good to know what kind of keys that you are going to be working with for some resource information about where you should be going. The keys are going to be stored in its own data set with a unique key label of its own. So in essence, the keys stored in the data set are also encrypted by the master key. And that, again, on top of that, is secured by RACF or ACF2. So the idea is to make those keys as difficult as possible to access, except when they're being used. Now, I'll bring this one up, master keys. They are what is used to create the other keys. That's also used to encrypt the keys in the data set. So, Number one rule, don't lose the master key. There are ways we have a, a hardened 
terminal facilities to create a key. We have a management system to keep track of the keys. And there's manual ways of recovering the keys if you need to. However, again, the rule is try not to lose the master one. That's integral to the entire process. So what are these keys? The master key is our, you know, that's used to generate the other keys. And it's only on the CEX hardware. So that's where it's stored. That's where all the other keys end up when they are secure keys. <clears throat> we can have a public or private key. That has to do with going across the network. One side has a public key that they're, they're given, and that is used by the private key to access the data. It's usually at some kind of handshaking, um, and you'll know it because when I you go into a, a point of sale unit and it suddenly takes four times as long for that transaction to be processed, you know you're being encrypted properly. On the mainframe, we have clear or secure keys. And we'll talk about the differences in those and why you need to be aware of that in an online processing environment. There are two kinds of keys here, uh, clear key and secure key. These are the basics. A clear key can be in storage. You can see that. You can be able to see that clear, and when it dumps, the key will be there. If it is correctly interpreted, Okay, this is not as far-fetched as it sounds. If someone can find that key and has a high-powered processor, they might be able to expose your data. It's used basically for software encryption. The advantage to this is that we do not need the hardware. The encryption processes will run on specialized code on the GPs of your machine. So it might be acceptable for some you know, short-lived ter term encryption or something that you you know, outside of your general requirements of having it totally secure. The secure key, that's only in the secure processor itself. You're never going to see that in storage. It's held under a master key. So whenever we want to get that, we are going to have to go to the CEX card and retrieve it. We've got APIs that can talk to it. Uh, Java can go after it directly. Um, the difficulty is that, as you can see on um, the next slide, when I start talking about comparisons between the two of them, a clear key has an elapsed time that is much superior to a secure key. Why is that? We just talked about that, because the secure key is stored on the card. Every time I want to get that key to encrypt or decrypt an entity, I'm going to have to do basically an I.O. to that card and back. So we see that there is a performance impact because as most of us know in the DBMS world, I.O. is the pain point for response times. So we have a, a performance impact here. And I'll talk about that on the next slide is how what we can do to mitigate that. We've got the clear key using the special instructions. Secure key is dispatched on the coprocessors. So we do have a difference in time. And that time is going to be uh, based upon what kind of workload is going to be decrypted or encrypted. Um, SQL, DLI, they act pretty much the same in this encryption thing. But we point out that some of our measurements show that the secure key elapsed time over a fairly long running job should be considerably higher than a clear key processing time. So we point out here, it's probably not appropriate for some online processing workloads. Now you need to make that decision yourself. And we'll talk about some things we can do to mitigate it. But I point out that in a single transaction that runs 250 milliseconds, I'm not too concerned if I'm only adding 10% to that. The individual user will probably not notice that we went from 250 milliseconds to 270 plus milliseconds. That's an individual thing. But consider the fact that I have to do a bulk process occasionally. If I've got 20 million records that I need to encrypt or decrypt to be able to process a batch or a month, you know, kind of process for a job, you know, a reporting that reads through the entire database, and I'm adding 
that 10% onto now all of those records at one time. That's an impact. So let's see what we can do about making that a little bit more palatable. I can create something that is called a protected key. What this is, is I've actually initially created a secure key and it resides on the CEX hardware just as it should and was described previously. It's safe. Now when I want to use it, my protected key is an interim key. It is a brand new encryption key that is used to, after retrieving that secure key, we wrap it in the protected key, and that's a key based upon timestamp that you're it, off of the LPAR of when you create it, and that key gets moved into clear storage. Remember now, it's the key is encrypted in storage, so it's not the real key that everyone thinks it is. However, we no longer need to do all of that I.O. type of call to get the information to encrypt or decrypt. It now has the same performance as a clear key. And that is a tremendous benefit over using a secure key. We have one I.O. to retrieve it at every bulk call. Now, the advantage there is also is that if this key is used in IMS, IMS does the retrieval and keeps it in storage so that every other online transaction now can use that protected key in storage. Okay, I hope I'm making sense. Is anyone coming up with questions at this point? They understand algorithms and keys? You haven't got any questions yet, so keep going. Okay. So, so either I've done a magnificent job or they're stunned. <laughs> That's it, yes. <laughs> so let's take the algorithms and the keys and we'll apply them to the four different levels of pervasive encryption. See how that works. <laughs> okay, application. This is gonna require a change to the application. It's very granular. I know government entities that like this. It's because the data is protected right up to the usage. The difficulty is that the applications are responsible for key management and key rolling and changes that are needed. Now in the application world, there actually is a DB2 function built in that does this. Under the application control, we can create a specific field that is going to be encrypted using the DDL for DB2. They can also have a prompt for remembering the key, which to me is a, an extreme non-separation of duties. We do have a couple of other things in there. It has to be a bear chair because we're using binary data once it becomes encrypted, so it has to be a be able to be used that way. And plus we extend that particular field because it's now in the table of DB2. Uh, and it's we only have one option here, the triple data set encryption standard, and that is okay for a lot of things, but it is we're limited to that one particular algorithm. So my next slide shows here's how we would create it. You note underneath the commit we've got we're setting an encryption password. We have a hint and it's where it's telling us where it's putting it. So when we get down to separation of duty instances, which is part of the regulation, regulatory compliance issues, we've got a DBA and or a programmer and or possibly the user who all know the password. So this is a concern. I'm certain that some auditor will look at that and say, this is not gonna work for your particular environment. It may work for some, uh, but again, this is up to the customer and their implementation. At the database encryption level, this is GDEZ, Guardian Data Encryption for Z. We can encrypt the data at a DB2 row or even a column level in DB2 or at the IMS segment level. It is transparent to the application and increases the separation of duties. An additional feature here is that it protects data in use within the memory buffers of the DBMS. Data set level encryption does not. The buffers are clear. So we have now moved using GDEZ, we've moved the encryption level to inside IMS or DB2 buffers so that when a dump is taken, that information is encrypted. Now, another advantage here is that all of the data, regardless of being encrypted at the data set level, 
is propagated forward as encrypted. So it, when my database becomes encrypted, all of my image copies show encrypted data. The before and after pictures of an encrypted data set update, database update, will show in the logs as encrypted also, which means that every time we use a log, the change accumulations, the unloads and reloads from tooling, not the utilities, from tooling, will also be encrypted. So we moved a level of encryption back into storage and could be considered much more uh, safer as an encryption level than some others. Now let's move on to the others so we can continue there. Oh, some GDEZ stuff. It's a single tool, both DB2 and IMS. It uses an ISPF interface and is installed through exit routines. The end of this in the appendix, which I'm not going to talk about, but it will be sent to you, is a step-by-step -step screen panel-by-panel -panel implementation process for both DB2 and IMS. So these are, you know, you'll be able to do it, take a look at it, see if it fits your environment or not. Some features and levels. Um, it's basically a straightforward implementation. We get a key label. We create an exit pointing at that key label and install it as an exit into the DBMS. And it's ready to go. The One of the other advantages, I can take the, the three encryption algorithms and use any one of those. I've got AES asterisked as that is the highest level and the most accepted at this time. Um, most people in IMS have seen a picture like this. We've added one little thing to it. When IMS application program does an insert of a segment, it comes into the control region. The control region loads the DVD and finds that there is an exit in the comp routine field of the DVD description. That exit gets invoked and says, I am looking for a key label. So the segment that is in the clear gets sent to ICSF services and comes back as an encrypted, then it gets put on the database. So this is a, a little addition we've had. ICSF services is going to do the work. It has the key label that is passed in the exit, gets it from the data set and sends it back. As we go out, it's a little, it's pretty much the same. We're just making a request. We get the segment, go to ICSF services based upon the exit. It's decrypted and then sent to the user. This, the, my appendix also contains the DB2 version of that. There are some restrictions in IMS that you need to be aware of how this works. It's entered as the comp routine field, a compression and encryption exit. It could be associated with multiple exits. We can use the same key for several segments. If you have a compression routine, the ISPF panels for GDEC will create a driver routine that will call both compression and encryption in the correct order for, de for going in and then decryption and decompression on the way out. The reason for that is pretty important because when we encrypt, we do not use repeating characters, which is primarily what compression is based on. So if we've encrypted first, that means we really don't have anything to compress. So the concept is compress first, then encrypt. Um, and yeah, high dam indexes can't be encrypted. That's uh, IMS restriction. We can't compress them either. Other IMS considerations. When you set up the ICSF, you initialize it, use checkoff equals no. And that will, uh, use the reduced path length, which is a help in performance. We can have a separate exit for each segment, but we're gonna have one for each cryptographic key, and that can be across many segments or a single segment. We can use the same one for multiple segments. We can decide, hey, all of my segments need to be encrypted differently. Um, one of the things uh, in the IMS world Believe it or not, people are going through and they have forgotten to authorize the data set where these exits reside. Yes, I know everyone will say, no, I've never done that. I will admit, I've done that. 
so I put that in there just to remind myself and everybody that I still make mistakes and to make sure it's APS authorized correctly. Next thing is that IMS loads these exit routines below the 16 meg line. So there is a virtual storage issue. Be aware of that. You may have to increase a region size in the MPPs in order for this to be effective. But be aware, it is below the 16 meg line. Also, everyone is aware, I hope that they know OSAM is owned by IMS. It does not go through Media Manager. Media Manager is where data set level encryption occurs. Since we don't use Media Manager, we cannot encrypt OSAM at a data set level. The only way we can do this at this time is with the Guardian Data Encryption product. I'll have more on that later. All right, data set level, it's again, transparent to applications. It uses standard protection keys just like we talked about previously. It's a key label you get. It covers vSAM for IMS, DB2, and other middleware. It's basically application transparent. It occurs at a different place. It is controlled by our current security access facility. No application changes are required, and we already have the infrastructure to allow access to certain data sets using this. We can have people that look at the data sets, that read them, that move them around without seeing them, and others that can update it. So my example here is I'm gonna, number one, I generate a key. And that could be done by the security people, by auditors, but will probably be a separate process from an IMS system programmer or a DB2 system programmer. We set up that label. We're actually going to allocate the data set using ID cams with a label parameter, and there's a sample of that later on how to do that. The label is simply the key level, and it can be done here as an ID cams, or it can be referred to in JCL. We associate that key label with a data set. This is the only difference we add to RACF. Not only do I need access to the data set at the level that I need to either update it, read it, uh, or is appropriate, I also need that similar access to the key label that is attached to that data set. Then I'm going to take my clear data, copy it from one data set to the next. The next one has my key label on it, and that's when the encryption occurs. Encryption, it just does not happen simply because I put a key label out there. I actually have to move the data from clear to encrypted. And this is a process that um, is going to go on regardless of whether we're using file level data set or hardware or DBMS, GDEZ type of encryption. It just does not magically happen. We have to move the data from one place to another. So here's kind of an example of, I've got a security administrator out here. He's got a defined key label is supplied. Here it shows as my data key. It's, I don't have a key label, just a key dash label showing that's where it fits. I've got a project A data, and I set this initially at universal access of none. Then I can start assigning who gets to do what. In this case, I've assigned Alice, she has update to it. So she can make an update to this data set. She has to have access to the data set and the key. Um, Bob, he can read it, so he can see what's in there. He just can't change anything in there. And then Eve, who is our storage administrator, our DASD miser, can move it around. She doesn't need to see what's in it. She can move it wherever she'd like for whatever purposes on the DASD, but she doesn't need to see what's in it. So this is all controlled by your current RACF profiles or ACF2 profiles. And is it's currently there. We're just adding a key label. And some people may be using a key label now anyway. So we're just making this available through the same processes. Another step for the RACF administrator. So as here's another example. I want to point out something. Um, I'm not going to go over this slide too much, but I did get a call not too long ago of someone saying, suddenly saying, hey, the IMS utility doesn't work, which I always find, you know, I have to stop and question this immediately because the IMS utility has been pretty stable since the late 70s. What happened was that the 
person who called me did not have access to the key label. And suddenly that was in the way. So it wasn't a utility issue. It was a RACF issue, but it manifested in IMS. And we all know that every once in a while, some of these problems come along and the first thing they say is it's IMS's fault. I have a t-shirt that says it's not IMS's fault, which I pull out whenever that happens. If you'd like a t-shirt, let me know. I might be able to arrange one for you. Hardware encryption. If you're using hardware, if you're using some of the, the uh, DS8800 series hardware, encryption may be enabled already, but it's not locked. We actually have to lock that for it to be effective. What is interesting, if it is on, you're being encrypted now and decrypted in the clear and you don't know it and probably have no issues with the performance there. Even locking it, the performance remains the same, but it does limit who can look at the data. The interesting, with disk, it becomes an interesting thing because it's the disk, everything on that disk gets one key and it's all encrypted. There's no granularity, it's all or nothing there. Now what happens when you put it on, you have a, a GUI interface that will turn it on or off. And what happens there <laughs> is that we create a key that encodes the actual key, and that is called a lock. So therefore you need access and authorization to use that lock for encoding and decoding on the data transfer. And that's gonna be stored outside the drive. It's only for authorized systems and authorized users. The thing here is that if there's a power outage or if it gets powered off, that authorization encoding disappears. So you have to go back and reset it until the next power outage. In the sense of a tape, we end up actually with two keys. One is for on-site and one is for off-site, which is a read-only key used for disaster recovery situations. It's always encrypted. It always uses AES 256-bit encryption. It does support the change of keys and it does require authentication. The IBM Security Key Lifecycle Manager is what we have out there. I believe that there are other vendors having similar products. Again, this is up to what you want. It does protect the disk against removal or retirement. Um, so as a physical device at rest, many people find this sufficient based upon their type of work. Okay, so here's the, the funnish part. One of my goals uh, a few years ago was to learn how to use animation in PPTs in pr these presentations. So I thought this was a really good opportunity to have a visual show of where this encryption occurs. And I'm do doing this from the bottom up. I'm starting at hardware level. I've got a pretty simplistic vision of my VOS mainframe and my hardware. And data coming in, in the clear, hoping you're watching this, goes into the message queue, into the application, into the buffer, data set IO, out to the disk. And it's on the disk, it changes into gobbledygook. That's a, my new technical term for encrypted stuff. Data set level is slightly different. It starts out the same. Our clear data comes in message queue, application processing, into the buffers, and at data set IO point where media manager gets a hold of it, it changes into gobbledygook. And at which point it gets sent out to the disk. And if disk encryption is turned on, it will turn gobbledygooier. So database level means start to see a pattern here. We come into the message queue application, but now at database with GDEZ, we can encrypt it in the buffer. Realize also in the buffer, it, the buffer contains multiple segments or rows from a table. If I only want one of those segments, everything else in that buffer remains encrypted and does not even get sent to the user, just the one we want. So we take it from the buffer, it goes to data set IO, where it changes to gobbledygooier, and then out to the disk, where it changes to gobbledygooier. Now you probably know, okay, application level is going to be quite similar. I took out the gobbledygooers, but we knew 
do our first change in the application. This is the closest point to the user that we are, can do a change. And Gobbledygoo now goes out to the disk, and it could be encrypted by GDEZ and the data set IO and the disk. But that's not shown here. All right, my next slide is simply a matrix of the degree of difficulty of maintenance and installation. In some cases, installation is simply turning it on. But that's just an idea of how much work is going to be required. All right, into IMS specifics. I'm going to talk a little bit about data sets that IMS does support, some that are not supported, and then where, where we're going. Here's our encryption. This is what we do support. Um, VSAM, doesn't matter if it's full function, HALDB, whatever, but be aware on the right-hand column, we've got some of the jobs that you need to be aware of that have to have access to the data set and the key label that that data set is encrypted under. Things like the control region, FDBR regions, etc. Now, this is an IMS 15 version. 14 will encrypt everything that I except for the next two. The PTF to allow DEDB encryption is only for 15. But we can encrypt DEDB now using data set level encryption. The WADS for 15 is turned to a vSAM linear data set. Hold that thought, we'll talk about it a little more later. If we do allocate it appropriately, we can encrypt the WADS. And throughout this list, we've got online date log data sets, batch data sets, SLIDs and RLDSs, all of those may be encrypted. But remember, the utilities accessing them need to have access to the labels. More that's important, all the change of queue, all the image copies, uh, CQS uh, can be encrypted. Connect Trader, the, if you're using IMS Connect Recorder Trace, that may be encrypted also. All of the BPEs, Trace data sets may be encrypted, and this also applies to the new type 2 traces in IMS in version 15. We just have to be have the address space that is going to use them be able to get to the key for processing. If you're using a coupling facility and system logger for shared queues, that may be encrypted also. And that's going to depend upon how your, your logger address space is set up. Okay, here's a list of not encrypted. At this point, uh, OSAM cannot be encrypted except using DD, GDEZ. Data set level does not apply at this time, which means that any OSAM allocated, like long message, short message, the RDS, cannot be encrypted. Um, so this is an, an, an issue that has been brought up. If you are a member of the GOLD program, you might have heard some talk about it. And essentially, um, we are working on it. We'll talk a little bit more later. Encrypting IMS, we're gonna create RACF rules with the data set pattern via a key parameter in the DFP segment. We can specify a key label directly in the JCL, dynamic allocation, TSO allocate, or the ID CAMs define. We can also use SMS to define the data set key label associated. Just remember that if you do that, you have to copy the data sets from unencrypted to encrypted in order for encryption to be in effect. Some more information on that. If it is encrypted, application transparency remains and Data encryption occurs when it's written to or read from desk underneath the data set level. It's open in the clear. We do require the permissions to be granted by your security access facility. And when we do the ID cams, there's a new key label parameter. And I think the next one has here. Oh, I don't have it right up. Okay. There, I, later on in the appendix, there is an example of an allocation of creating a data set with a key label. A couple of other things, when we're doing data sets, there's some things that we need to be aware of. We always need to be aware of if we have logicals and indexes. The sort data, the work file data for anything that has an index or a logical relationship 
that data is going to be in the clear during the creation of the data set. So if we're using a separate reorg product, uh, you're gonna have to consult them. But in our cases, when we use the utility, those files are in the clear during the actual build of the data set. So what would happen if you didn't have all of this information? You're gonna get a RACF error. And I wanted to point out that the IEC 161i message, I mean, it, you don't see it so much anymore because we have PDFs. It used to be that that message itself was about an inch thick of paper manual. So IBM, in its infinite wisdom, decided that the IEC 161i message was the good place to put all of the return information of encryption. So now we've doubled the size paper-wise of that. I brought this one up because while it is out there, it takes some finding to get to. I find these messages show up much faster if you use Google. That was the way I found mine initially. Google can find it faster than I could in Knowledge Center. So as we run up on uh, our considerations here, um, application logic, if we're gonna go there, that logic is going to be very much involved in where you put the code. The data encryption tool, that's going to be a data administrator, DBA type thing, unloading and reloading the database or table to make it encrypted. Removes it from the application program area and becomes more transparent there. The user is not aware of it. It meets all of our security requirements, performance requirements. We've got to think about single transaction versus bulk processes and whatever hardware is available. Remember the Z14 Crypto Express Card 6, five times faster than its predecessor. This is a big benefit. Um, it's not insignificant. There's a lot of things going on here. Who needs to be involved? It is going to be a group effort. Security will be involved. Auditors will be involved. Storage people will be involved because while it's being done, you're going to have twice as much of the data being created. You're going to have two copies of that data set, one encrypted, one not. But while the process is on, storage is important. And then who's going to do the work? So have a plan, have a, a backup plan and a backup plan. If you start doing this, image copy your database in case something goes wrong, you can restore it. The rest of this is information on how to's. How do we migrate a set of old in an IMS that needs to be up 24 by 7? Same thing with logs, the same thing with HALDBs. All of this has, we've got some step-by-step -step information. All right, all the steps might not be exactly what you are accustomed to, but they are there for a starting point for your plans. This will be included in what I send out. Um, again, you're welcome to contact me if there's questions. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much then, Dennis. Um, yeah, has anyone got any questions? And if you want to type them in now, I'll, we'll, we'll pause for a second. Um, okay, first question for you, Dennis. I'm from Tom Gates. We have utility that generates vSAM Dell DEF statements. Is the key label content unique to each data set? It does not have to be. It could be either. It could be unique or not. You could have a key label for multiple data sets. They would use the same algorithm and the same key label. Um, or you could have them all different. It doesn't matter. It's up to your installation. Okay, thank you. Yep, Tom says thanks. Let's see if anyone else has got a question. Your yeah, Karen Tish has said thank you, Dennis. Um, she had to leave a little bit earlier, but uh, yeah, she she was uh, uh, enjoyed what she saw. Very nice. Thank you. Okay, well, I will move on. If any else come, anyone else? Oh, here we are. Is encryption viable with IMS version 14? Asked Peter Scarpe in R2. Uh, yes, it is. Um, without OSAM, 
it would be for the vsam part of ims only and dedbs would no no longer be able to be encrypted under 14 we need that version 15 only ptf so that's one of the things about pushing people to 15 if they want encryption we will be able to do dedbs and wads there Okay, thank you for that. Any more? Well, okay. Oh. Eva Blair Snyder says, uh, Thank you, Dennis. This is the second time I've heard it within the month and learned something new. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, Tom Gates has asked whether any earlier than IMS version 14, I think. For oh, any earlier? Yeah. Uh, the Guardian data in encryption uh, will work on any uh, GA IMS. The data set level encryption is going to be based upon where you are on hardware and DFS media manager. I think you need a special PTF if you're on ZOS 2.2. Uh, 2.3 has it included. Okay, thanks. Uh, Thomas Esser has said, can the key be encrypted? Um, the key is encrypted in storage if we have a hard, the CEX hardware. Um, the, secu the protected key will be encrypted in storage as it moves out. Other than that, I'm not quite sure where Tom's going on that question. I don't know. I'll see if he comes back with anything else to clarify. Oh, I, as in the key of a database being encrypted? Yes, it's possible to do so. Work with your installation people to see if that's feasible. Sometimes it is not. Like, uh, yes, yes, he says, yes, this is what I want to know. So you've answered that. Brilliant. Okay, if there's no more questions, then can I say thank you very much, Dennis? Um, because we're a virtual user group, can you uh, assume that you're hearing a virtual round of applause then at the moment? I'll be glad to. <laughs> okay. uh, thank you very much for having me. This is great. All right. Thank you very much. Right. Let me take back control. Go back to my screen. Okay. Yeah. No, thanks, Dennis. So that, that really was interesting and good. Um, so where are we then? In terms of news, um, since we last met, there hasn't really been any, although don't forget the IMS is now updated um, quarterly. So uh, I think there's a, a new one of those just coming out. As for articles, then we've had Modernize in the IMS Makerspace by Shannon Far Farrington on the uh, Z Systems Developer Community. We've had... What's new in IMS OTMA for mobile transactions by Rita Shi, Sweta Shridharan, and Jack Huan. That was in IBM Systems Magazine in October. And there's been What Happens When You Mix IMS and Zos Connect Enterprise Edition by Jazz Deep Singh. And that was on the Z Systems Developer Communi Community uh, in early October. Okay, I said I was going to ask for feedback. Um, can you give us feedback about this meeting? Uh, you can email your comments to me. The address is on screen. Or if you go to our website, that's fundy.com forward slash virtual IMS, you can go to the Contact Us page. So, meeting dates coming soon. Um, our next meeting, then next year, is on the 5th of February. We've got IBM's Kevin Height, and he's talking about IMS ODB. And then after that, we've got a meeting on the 9th of April. Put that in your calendar. We're hoping to have um, Scott Quillacy talking for that one. 
I put the speaker opportunity in there because um, I was going to ask whether uh, we have any end users who would like to talk at one of these meetings uh, about the issues and opportunities they face using IMS or, or some aspect of IMS at their sites. If you can let me know if you're uh, willing to speak, that would be great. And of course, can I remind you that you can keep up to date with what's happening in the world of IMS and on the Virtual IMS Use Group website by following us on Facebook and Twitter. And you can also join the Virtual IMS group on LinkedIn. The URLs are all on the home page of the website. Um, Remember to like us, of course, on Facebook, because that's how social media works with likes. And if you're a tweeter or an Instagrammer, or I suppose Facebook these days, uh, we use the hashtag virtual IMS if you want to talk about us. So that's all for this meeting of the virtual IMS user group. Um, can I thank you all for attending? I must thank Fundy Software, They're the people who sponsor this user group and make it all possible. And of course, I particularly want to thank Dennis Eichelberger for today's presentation. Um, the, the, uh, the slides will be on the website later, as I said earlier. So that's it. Thank you all very much for joining the meeting. And I look forward to seeing you next time, which will be on the 5th of February. So thank you all and goodbye.